Christmas. The word may be more than any other in our vocabulary. When spoken or even silently considered, unleashes a flood of memories and emotions for millions of Americans, young and old. Just think about it. It can, for at least an instant, warm the chilliest of nights, bring hope, exhilaration, joy, and even spiritual redemption. It represents a time of year when people just seem nicer, more forgiving, a little more willing to help. It brings out our best. It transforms cold and personal city streets into magical wonderlands and rekindles in many a childlike quality forgotten the rest of the time. It's a holiday that takes us home. It was such a small town. All the people in town knew each other, obviously. And some of the houses even strung lights between the houses, you know, and all the doors were open. You could walk in any time and have an eggnog or a cup of coffee. Uh, it was very, very family kind of uh, place to grow up. It was, it was wonderful. My grandmother always cooked, so she would, when she arrived, we'd run to the door, and there would be my grandmother and grandfather, and she would have this. She'd bring chocolate chip cookies and peanut brittle and fudge. I think my earliest Christmas um, memory is um, at night, and it was the year that um, Grandma, Grandpa, and my aunt and uncle came to our house. We usually went to my grandparents' house. We all um, sat around um, our dining room table and we played Monopoly together. And I remember, I remember because my grandfather was a little shady with the Monopoly money. Well, I grew up in a real simple home. We didn't have anything. Uh, we did without. You wore hand-me-down clothes and you didn't have a whole lot of unnecessary stuff. So Christmas was a huge explosion of uh, gift giving. It was the only time of year we had that kind of stuff. My brother and I um, would get up as soon as we could. We, we were early risers and um, started waking up our parents and unwrapping Christmas presents. Uh, we took a picture at Christmas during the lifetime of my uncle, Martin Luther King Jr. He and my dad, Reverend A.D. King, were still alive and their wives were there, and their sister and her husband, and the whole family. So we had the Christmas dinner and everything, and then we had to pose for a picture. We uh, had snow, and uh, all the red, green, and the colored lights. Home was originally in New York City. It started Christmas in a one-bedroom apartment, and there was five kids, so there was seven of us cramped in there, and the tree was stuffed in the living room. And it was that great feeling of waking up in the morning and hoping that there was stuff under it. So I remember the colors, the smells, the fun, the laughter. Daddy would play the violin and Uncle Martin, we called him Uncle ML, he would play a little bit on the piano and the women would sing and my grandmother would play. Oh man, it was super. And my mom would always put the stockings next to our bed so the first thing when we woke up was we'd see a stocking right there. For a holiday observance with such meaning for so many Americans, You'd be surprised to learn that it had a very inauspicious beginning in this country. The celebration of Christ's birth, in one form or another, can be traced back to 4th century Rome. But there are scarce accounts of its observance in colonial America until the mid-1800s. Actually, in New England, they banned all Christmas celebrations. You didn't do Christmas. Uh, as late as 1870 in Boston, you did not celebrate Christmas in public schools or anything else. You'd get in trouble for doing that because they were trying to simplify religion, get all the, the elaborate glamour out of it and all the celebrations, just make it real simple between you and God. People living in southern colonies like Virginia, where life was less impacted by Quaker and Puritan influences, were more likely to observe the holiday. Uh, George Washington celebrates Christmas, and it's a week-long festival when he celebrates Christmas. It involves going to church, and it involves fox hunting on, on his estate, Mount Vernon, so it's a big deal. Finally, on June 26, 1870, the United States Congress declared Christmas a federal holiday, allowing one of the most impactful new American traditions to spread unabated in full glory. Almost immediately, a new industry was born, churning out nativity scenes, candy canes, mail-order fruitcake, and of course, jolly old St. Nick.
So I began to ask my dad, Santa Claus is coming, right? He said, yeah, baby, so you need to go to bed. And mom, hurry up and go to bed. Most historians agree that St. Nicholas was born in Turkey in the mid third century. Over 1,700 years old. We're not quite sure. That's, that's a lot of days, a lot of years. <laughs> Author Washington Irving gave Americans their first detailed description of St. Nick in 1809 in a comedic book called A History of New York from the beginning of the world to the end of the Dutch dynasty. It was most likely Irving's description that served as inspiration for what may be the iconic American Christmas creation. A little poem originally titled A Visit from St. Nicholas, written by Clement Clark Moore on a snowy Christmas Eve night in 1822. He read it to his wife and six kids the same night. Twas the night before Christmas when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. When out on the lawn there rose a clutter, I sprang from the bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters and threw up the sash. When what to my wandering eyes should appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer. With a little old driver so lively and quick, I knew in a moment it must be St. Nick. Moore's poem was published the next year by a New York newspaper and since then has been reprinted and translated around the world countless times. He called it his mere trifle, and he never bothered to have it copyrighted. <laughs> Merry Christmas! In 1870, the year Christmas became a national holiday, the Macy's department store in New York City's Herald Square invited Santa to come and listen to children's Christmas wishes in person, and a new tradition was born. For those brave young souls willing to wager that their name appeared on the nice side of Santa's ledger, it was a chance to give flight to fancy, to articulate the visions dancing in their heads. Everybody's friend has something for everyone. If you know of someone he might miss, open up your heart and have a Merry Christmas. For, for me, at that age, uh, electric trains were the big attraction uh, at Christmas time. But I wanted a metal detector because I was convinced I was going to find buried treasure and work was for suckers and I was going to figure it out. Uh, I was obsessed with that. I also um, was a, a bit of a strong personality um, and got a couple lumps of coal in my stocking for one Christmas. I'm still one of those girls that want a pony <laughs> someday. But I begged and begged and begged, but I just I couldn't do it. I like to let them tell me what they think and uh, if old Santa can make them happy, that's what it's all about, and spread that Christmas spirit. I remember I'd make up my Christmas list, and I just want more arrows and maybe some broadheads, uh, a BB gun and a pellet rifle and a new slingshot. <laughs> so, but we'd actually get all this stuff. When I was carrying my son, and the doctor told me, this baby's due December 25th. And I said, oh, wow, there can never be a better Christmas present. And then sometimes, well, let's just say, Santa works in mysterious ways. My brother and I both had this, had this box that was just huge and really heavy. So Christmas Day we opened it, it was two gigantic Webster dictionaries. <laughs> so we were like, oh, Webster dictionaries. But the irony of that is that now I've written, I've, I've, in, as I've matured, I've written a book. And I love to write, and I just wrote 90 essays about the Federalist Papers, so you know, maybe that dictionary uh, ha had a point. The one that ended up having the most meaning was the one I hated the most, and it was the Christmas sweater. But I mean, I had a lot of gifts to choose from, really. I mean, it was like two years before I got a chicken, so. <laughs> it's a strange family and a strange childhood. I mean, you wonder why it turned out this way. <laughs> But there's another side to being Santa that has nothing to do with Xboxes, Legos, or Easy Bake Ovens. Every year, there are children who come out with a dream, a hope, or a wish that exceeds the abilities of even Santa. One comes to mind, it was a stormy night, real, it snows a lot here. And it was after nine, the house closes at nine so I can get back up there and Mrs. Claus has things for me to do at the North Pole. So it was after nine o'clock and I look out the window and there's old pickup truck pulls in and um, 
a dad and a little daughter, neither one of them had a hat on and it's snowing hard and they come running in like they're going to be late. They didn't want to miss, miss the Santa visit. And dad, he stood back there and we we're alone, the little girl and I and a couple of helpers here. And she walks up and she didn't really look at me. Her glasses were crooked. And I says, well, what would you like for Christmas? And she goes, I want my mom to come home. And uh, Santa gets those questions. And I said, well, I, hey, I don't, well, that's, I don't know what I can do there. I'm real good at toys. Is there any toys you'd like this year? Oh, I, I just want my mom to come home. She wouldn't look at me. She just stared at my boots. And I said, all right, I'll go back to the North Pole and I'll talk to Mrs. Santa and I'll, I'll say a prayer for your mom and we'll see what happens. And I want you to have a Merry Christmas. And she didn't want, I asked her if she had any questions about the North Pole, she didn't. She just had that one request. She wanted her mom to come home for Christmas. And uh, so she got up from my knee and she walked over to the other side of the room. I said, well, I got a few seconds. I'm gonna say that prayer right now. and I. I said the prayer for her mom. And then her dad walks up to me and he says, Santa, we were here last year. She asked you the same question and you gave her the same answer. And all I could think was, <laughs> well, that's, I'm glad I did. And uh, he goes, when we go home tonight, her mom's gonna be there. And uh, I thought, holy peppermint sticks. That's wonderful. So I never forget to say my prayers after that. Five, four, three, two. It worked. Our Christmas tree is always a big deal in our house because we have to get the perfect tree that'll fit in our house. A color-coded um, white tree sometimes um, with like the same color ornaments and tinsel. I just love always getting together with the family and putting ornaments on, like little handmade ornaments we've made growing up. Uh, well, I used to be famous for trimming the Christmas tree uh, and that was my job to, uh, to, uh, to put all the lights on first and uh, then, then the uh, the ornaments, and then the, the the cotton, then sprinkle over the snow. The Christmas tree didn't become a big part of the American celebration until the 1880s, when industrious types started carting them into the cities for sale on street corners and in town squares. Credit for the tradition here in America goes to German immigrants who brought the custom from the old country where its presence in the home was a tribute to the power of God. The first glass tree ornaments also came from Germany, replacing homemade trinkets and strings of popcorns and nuts that had become a decorating staple. But not everyone was on board with the new evergreen icon. Christmas purists in this country saw the tree and its flashy ornaments as encroaching upon the older tradition of the Christmas stocking. It is a significant fact that comparatively few Christmas trees were exposed for sale this year. There is a very evident decrease in the demand for them, and this is unquestionably due to the revival of the Christmas stocking. The German Christmas tree, a rootless and lifeless corpse, was never worthy of the day. So said none other than the New York Times. In those days, it was pretty much an either-or proposition. A tree or stockings, not both. Uh, you got to go to Benjamin Harrison before you really get a Christmas in the White House with a Christmas tree. And then the electricity comes to the White House in 1891. So under the Clevelands in 1895, you have the first lights on the Christmas tree, which is a, a, a big deal. By 1900, it was estimated that one in five American homes had a Christmas tree. Two decades later, the President of the United States cemented its place in American history. You have to go all the way to Calvin Coolidge in 1923 before you get the first outdoor Christmas tree. The lighting of the, of the national Christmas tree was a really, really big thing. Today, it's estimated that of the 112 million homes in America, 80 million will put up a Christmas tree this year. 
The majority, about 62% of them, will be artificial. Oh, and one more thing. No official count is available, but it's widely believed that the majority of these homes will also have Christmas stockings. Now that's progress. By the way, the first commercial Christmas card was created in London in 1843 by John Calcott Horsley. The card's message stressed feeding the hungry and clothing the naked and featured a merry family celebrating the holiday. It ended up causing a bit of a stir since each of the family members, including the children, were depicted partaking of <coughs> holiday cheer, booze, oops, I think my favorite Christmas movie is How the Grinch Stole Christmas. My favorite Christmas movie is probably Elf. Miracle on 34th Street. The Christmas Story. It's a Wonderful Life, something classic <laughs> like that. Up through the end of the 19th century, the American Christmas experience tended to be unique family to family, or at least region to region. The arrival of mass media in the 20th century made for a more common experience. And, uh, here to knock a few fast ones down the third base line is that struggling young comedian who sat up all night shooting craps with Santa Claus, Francis Langford's bodyguard in North Africa, Bob Hope. New icons were created, and for better or worse, the Christmas story became a part of America's pop culture and, overall, a huge commercial success. In 1939, the Montgomery Ward department store commissioned employee Robert L. May to write a poem to be handed out to children in the store at Christmas time. It was called Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. That's right. One of America's all-time favorites started out as a crummy commercial. The success of this simple story opened the floodgates. The 40s saw a flurry of Christmas-themed movies. And perhaps the most iconic of them all, It's a Wonderful Life. The movie tops most people's list of all-time Christmas classics and has been honored by the American Film Institute as one of the 100 best American films ever made. And yet it was a box office disappointment in 1946. As Hollywood churned out more and more Christmas-themed entertainment, New classics were few and far between. The focus turned from family and goodwill to calamity, anxiety, and even the supernatural. In 1983, however, the list of Christmas classics grew by one. You'll shoot your eye out! You'll shoot your eye out! <laughs> wow, it's such an amazing thing to be a part of. I. Um, some people will say, well, you probably don't like to talk about it. I do. It's, um, I feel very blessed to be a part of a movie that has such a positive impact on so many people that people relate to and people really personalize and feel like it really was their family. A Christmas Story centers on a nine-year-old Ralphie's dream of an official Red Ryder BB gun for Christmas. But the real story is about family and the life-changing power of the holiday. And like the other Christmas classics we hold dear, it reminds us of maybe a simpler time. Even the time period, the movie took place, you know, early 40s. And I had a flight attendant recently come up to me and said, boy, you look like the kid from A Christmas Story, but it couldn't have been because that movie was shot in the 40s. I think it's a timeless movie. Like It's a Wonderful Life, success for the movie came post box office. Nobody believed in the movie. The studios didn't, the financiers didn't. When it was distributed originally, it did not do very well in the theaters, and really, in the early 80s, it was the collision of cable and video, really the birth of video and pay cable, that made that movie a hit. Peter got to keep the official Red Rider baby gun, with the compass in the stock, and the bright pink bunny suit, a gift from Ralphie's aunt. As television became more and more a part of the American experience, one performer became synonymous with Christmas, the Andy Williams Show and especially his Christmas specials, were the epitome of family-focused entertainment, because they all featured his family. Well, I was fortunate enough to have a television series uh, on NBC, which started in 1962 and went for nine years. Then we had the best uh, 
uh, home movies, you know, the children and growing up that you could possibly have because we had it on, on film from the television shows. And then in 1963, I think we started with the whole family. My uh, first child was born and we showed. So what was really important, I think, to, to viewers is that they could see the children grow up, you know, as the years went by. Those were my big Christmas memories with those television shows. The unique thing about Christmas is how it makes us feel. I feel it when I uh, have my kids on my lap or uh, yesterday I woke up and uh, my son had crawled into bed with me uh, in the night and uh, I woke up and he was laying right next to me and he woke up and he looked at me and he just rolled over and he just gave me a big hug and then we read a, a story in the morning. Um, I don't know, there's something about that. Childhood, unconditional love. It's about the joy. I feel Christmas in my heart when I, uh, when I hear the music and see the colors. A cinnamon always seems to remind me of Christmas, the smell of cinnamon. My mom would get these cinnamon sticks that they would put into uh, their coffee, um, and we would grab the cinnamon sticks and eat them. It's just the, about the essence of, of letting somebody know you love them. It's when it's, it's in the, the quiet moments or the, um, or maybe the, the, the minute after the, the presents are done. The sights, the sounds, the tastes, the smells. Christmas overwhelms our senses like no other holiday or season on the calendar. And yet that's not the true power of the holiday. Christmas touches something inside of us. In many Americans, it lifts the jaded, cynical filter that tends to define our daily life and allows us to feel, to feel thankful, compassionate. And it reaffirms that we're here for a purpose beyond our own self-interest. We call it the Christmas spirit, and throughout our history, it has always been a part of the American holiday experience. With the Lincolns, when you get to Abraham Lincoln, they're in the middle of the Civil War. So Christmas time for them is that Mary Todd Lincoln organizes all sorts of things to go give the guys at the hospitals, all the wounded soldiers. A few years later, author Louisa May Alcott illustrated America's Christmas spirit in her famous book about the March sisters, Little Women. There's nothing to eat over there, and the oldest boy came to tell me they were suffering hunger and cold. My girls, will you give them your breakfast as a Christmas present? It was important for my family, um, to my parents, to not give any gifts to the kids, but to have all of us present gifts to other children in the neighborhood who didn't uh, have the opportunity to have as many gifts. I think best gift that was ever given to me uh, was uh, the, the, in a really broad sense, was the inability to buy stuff for my kids one year. I couldn't give them gifts. I couldn't afford it. I went shopping at the CVS for them. And I remember that year, I felt like the biggest loser dad ever. I felt like a failure. Um, but in the end, um, that period made me understand um, it's not about the presents. It's not about the presents. That was the year that I gave my daughter a sleigh bell. She got a sleigh bell for Christmas. And that sleigh bell is framed in our, in our house. And uh, 
It's her best Christmas present that she ever received. Christmas can change people. In 1891, Captain Joseph McPhee of the Salvation Army was in agony. As he walked through the streets of San Francisco, the poor were everywhere. Funding to feed them was not. In his desperation, he grabbed a lobster kettle and a bell and stood near the ferry landing, ringing his bell, bringing attention to a sign he had created that simply said, keep the pot boiling. That year, he raised enough money to feed many of the poor around him. In just the last 10 years, the now famous bell ringers with their red kettles have raised over a billion dollars and the Salvation Army helps more than 30 million people each year. The Christmas Spirit. I remember reading letters and finding one envelope that had, it felt like it was heavy. So I said to Santa, what is this? It feels like it has money in it. And um, he said, oh, I remember those people. I remember they came in a rusty old car and the dad brought the little boy and they seemed very quiet and timid, and the little boy handed me this envelope. And when I opened it, it was a note to Santa saying, please give this to the poor children in the world. Be amazed at the miracle of this one time of year where we still allow ourselves to see the pain in others, um, and sometimes in ourself. Perhaps more than any other time of year, at Christmas, we take stock. We peek behind the facade in search of true meaning in our lives. We're reintroduced to our families, to our priorities, in ways that don't always seem possible the rest of the year. For many of us, it's a time of redemption. A song my mother used to always always pause and listen to and I didn't understand it at the beginning um, and she would always put her uh, uh, hands on my shoulders or she would put her hand on my head and she would say you're my little altar boy little altar boy please let me hear you cry I I didn't really listen to the words until I was much older. You can still go up to the altar and, and will you just pray for me? Will you just tell the Lord that um, I'm sorry? Do take my sins away. And that's the whole message of Christmas. The whole message of Christmas is this little baby is coming so you can approach, so you can have a second chance. And the Christmas story out of the book of Luke, that's always going to be my very favorite story. Joseph went up from Galilee to the city of David, called Bethlehem, this wife Mary who was with child. And it was there her baby would be born. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. An angel appeared and said to them, Do not be afraid, for I bring you good tidings of great joy for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior which is Christ the Lord. For God sent his son to offer hope and peace.